The United States was created as a nation committed to freedom and individual rights because our founders saw themselves as heirs to a legacy of English liberty reaching back over 500 years to the Magna Carta. Another document that greatly influenced the founders was the British Declaration of Rights, adopted in 1688. The Magna Carta and the Declaration of Rights stand as, as the two great examples in English history of, of how a people, of course in Magna Carta it's the barons, and uh, in, in 1688 it is the English people, but it's really the Whig aristocracy and, and the ruling class, uh, have, in a, have in a sense risen up against a monarchy that they perceive as corrupt or tyrannical or some combination of those things. And they've literally wrested from those kings uh, a, a confirmation of the rights that they believe they have possessed all along or entitled to possess, but which have been improperly denied them. Learning from centuries of British history and philosophy, the founders attempted to create a government that would secure and respect the fundamental rights of its citizens. The controversy of the 17th century in England and as they're replicated in America were controversies primarily about rights of conscience, about political rights, about trial by jury. I mean, these things are deeply controverted back home in England, and Americans are very sensitive to that. The Bill of Rights protects freedom of speech, it protects freedom of property, it protects due process. That probably reflects the philosophical training that the founders had. The founders were very influenced by natural law philosophers like the English philosopher John Locke, who wanted to protect life, liberty, or property. After decades of religious turmoil and revolution, the British Parliament passed the Declaration of Rights in 1688. The Declaration reaffirmed the right of Englishmen to own property, petition the government, and freely exercise their religion. But even before that 1688 Declaration, those fleeing religious oppression made their English rights part of colonial law here in the New World. In 1641, Massachusetts adopted its Body of Liberties, ensuring, among other things, that citizens could speak freely and petition the government, that the state had to pay for private property if taken for public use, that the accused had the right to a public trial, could not be tried twice for the same crime, and if convicted, could not be subjected to cruel punishment or required to pay excessive bail. Other colonies followed suit, mapping a blueprint for today's Bill of Rights. The political controversies that start with the Stamp Act give Americans a, an even stronger reason to hark back both to English precedents and to their own charters, or whatever statements they had, whether they were legislative or enactments or charters, uh, but all would seem to confirm that Americans are supposed to enjoy in, in effect, an equality of rights with Englishmen back at home. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson echoed the Declaration of Rights. These rights, said Jefferson, were God-given and could not be taken away. The colonists had no choice but to break with England because of repeated efforts by the British king to violate these inalienable rights. Colonies from New Hampshire to Georgia also issued their own declarations. Colonists in Virginia were so eager for independence that their declaration was issued before Jefferson's. Authored by the fiercely individualistic George Mason, the Virginia Declaration protected nearly all the rights later included in the nation's Bill of Rights. The Virginia Declaration of Rights is the first of these state declarations of rights. They're not really constitutional documents. They're kinds of general statements of principle which don't really have much legal effect. They don't have much constitutional force but they do express a number of underlying beliefs, uh, both about the, the kinds of rights and liberties that Americans ought to enjoy, but also about general principles of government. The Virginia Declaration of Rights and others served as models for James Madison as he laid out a vision for a national Bill of Rights over a decade later. Like the Declaration of Independence, these state declarations focused on the right of the people to reform, alter, or even abolish their government when it failed to protect individual rights. The abuses by the British Crown helped to produce an overwhelming consensus that things would and should be different here in the New World. I'm Tim O'Brien.
In the Declaration of Independence, the founders argued government was created for one fundamental purpose, to protect rights. So why quarrel over adding a Bill of Rights to the Constitution? Federalists such as New York's Alexander Hamilton and Virginia's James Madison believed a Bill of Rights was unnecessary since the Constitution gave the federal government only limited powers. Hamilton and Madison also worried that any list of rights would surely be incomplete and might demean those rights not listed or hamper the protection of new rights as society changed. Federalist case against the Bill of Rights is that the Bill of Rights is unnecessary and dangerous. Unnecessary because the tradition of a Bill of Rights is to protect the right of the people or the majority against the unreasonable actions of the one or the few. And since the Constitution of the United States is ordained by we the people, the Constitution is a Bill of Rights in terms of what the Bill of Rights tradition is. It's unnecessary. It's dangerous in the sense that if you start listing rights and you forget one, does that imply by silence that you don't have it? However, anti-federalists such as Virginian George Mason feared a strong central government would encroach on the freedoms they had fought a revolution to preserve. In wanting to guarantee that some uniquely precious rights would never be abridged, Mason supported a bill enumerating those rights. He argued a Bill of Rights would give great quiet to the people and could be prepared in a few hours with the aid of the state declarations. Those who thought a Bill of Rights was most essential for the federal constitution were those who, of course, had most suspicion of the powers that were entrusted to the new federal government. They sensed that the structure was imperfect, that the powers were extensive, that the limitations on those powers were insufficient, and so it became all the more important to people conscious of these imperfections in the Constitution, that there be a standard of rights that people could return to should they be violated in the future. Though not a supporter of a Bill of Rights, James Madison was eager to secure the people's loyalty to the new Constitution. As Congress debated a Bill of Rights, Madison corresponded with Thomas Jefferson, who was in Paris serving as ambassador to France. Jefferson challenged the Federalist concerns about listing rights, arguing that half a loaf is better than no bread. If we cannot secure all our rights, let us secure what we can. Madison worried that a Bill of Rights would not stop popular majorities, which he considered a serious threat to individual rights. There was widespread support for bills of rights, and insofar as people suspected that the new government would have too much power, they felt it was essential that there be some basic rights stated that would be a, a standard for limitations on that power. While Madison was not entirely convinced, his friends' urgings and popular sentiment led him to support a Bill of Rights. In 1789, he began gathering support for a bill that would highlight important freedoms without fundamentally altering the recently ratified Constitution. Influenced by Jefferson's correspondence and state documents such as the Virginia Declaration of Rights, Madison proposed over a dozen small changes to Articles 1 and 3. He presented these amendments as small additions, not as a list separate from the Constitution. But several members of the House of Representatives felt Congress could not tamper with the original Constitution. The amendments were listed at the end rather than incorporated in the Constitution because Roger Sherman of Connecticut argued that the Congress had no right to propose changes to the body of the Constitution. The Constitution had been ratified by the people, by the sovereign people. That could not be changed. The only thing that could be done was that there could be subsequent amendments listed at the end. And that made the Bill of Rights, as we understand it, look like the afterthought that in fact it was. After a grueling debate, 17 amendments were sent to the Senate. They approved 12, which were sent to the states for ratification. After more than two years, Virginia State Convention finally ratified 10 of these amendments on December 15, 1791. These first 10 amendments to the Constitution are commonly known as the Bill of Rights. I'm Tim O'Brien.